real life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Welcome to our podcast and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Our videos are for information purposes only and any accusations are alleged unless found guilty in a court of law. Let the show begin. I'm just going to be just discussing random different things that we want to cover, you know, as uh, as a group in a whole moving forward, uh, what we would like to see happen, um, different, you know, issues that are going on right now that are causing, you know, all this victimization. So I think we're just kind of winging it today. Is that what we're doing, ladies? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anywhere in particular that, that either of you would like to start? Um, well, today I got a message from a gal in Texas, and she was talking about how she was raped by a gentleman um, and that the gentleman came back a few years later, and now he's getting custody of their child. Mm -hmm. um, she just got the parental um, agreement done with the courts and they didn't even hear anything she had to say. They wouldn't look at any of her evidence. They said that she is uh, not happy or resentful of the father. And so the father should get full custody. So mm -hmm. they granted that. And I think that it's a big trick that we are falsely led to believe that family court is going to be a place where we're going to have justice and justice is going to be served. And so people often go into courts thinking, oh, well, he abused me. He abused me. He did whatever. I'm definitely going to win. And then things like this happen, especially mm -hmm. in Texas, because we all know that Texas is working outside. Of, well, they all are. But. Texas is especially bad. Um, so I don't even really know how to help her at this point. She's going to have to try to maybe get a different judge. She could um, discredit her judge. So I think she what she thinks is happening is that her uh, his new girlfriend is like the senator or something. Um mm -hmm. And she showed up to the hearing with her um, senator pin. And uh, the first hearing that she showed up at, I guess her ex the rest, was um, bragging that he's dating her, the representative. Quite like some good old fashioned intimidation. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, nothing like a little nepotism to get you through court. Oh. It's like, and, and the court systems let people get away with this too. And it's just, it's sad. It is yeah. sad. I, I actually, whenever I went in and filed my, so I came in, I, I, I've dealt with something kind of similar, but not all the way, but it happens so much. Um, I, I went in from out of state. I, I'm from Mississippi and I was going to Louisiana to file an order of protection. And so they scheduled me an order of protection for felony abuse. It was like aggravated assault with and that kind of stuff. And uh, whenever I get in there to do my hearing, they allowed him, the perpetrator, to serve me um, custody papers on my child, who, by the way, wasn't even his child. He had no legal right to her. He had no, she had another father, according to law. He had not even provided paternity, none of them like that. And um, so what they did was they continued making me believe that I would be heard on my domestic abuse case. And instead they dissolved it without allowing me to be heard and turned it into a custody case. Okay. For him who he still to this day, four years later, hasn't even proved paternity on my child. Uh, she has a father according to law. That's not him. So they do stuff like that all the time. Um, even if you don't have a senator girlfriend, I mean, it's insane. Um, the stuff that they're doing in family courts, family courts has really family court has, I mean, they're the processes that we're dealing with, and it's not just me. Like in Louisiana, I know tons of people are dealing with it. Krista Abelsath, uh, she was raped when she was 16 years old. And um, 
as a minor by a man that was in his upper thirties and he got her pregnant and at five years old for her child, he took her to court under the same judge I have. And the judge awarded the full custody of the child made Krista pay child support. Okay. And yes. all other kinds of things she went and she, um, you know, she went to the media, Nancy Grace, I was telling Danielle this last time we got together, but Nancy Grace called the judges chambers and the DA's office and said, what the hell is going on down there? Like, what, what is this? They still did nothing about it. He still never got prosecuted. He still had the child. He raped the child. Okay. Um, but, but I mean, it's, and it's all the things, you know, the kids go missing, the everything like it's just garbage and family court has really, I believe it's more of like, um, it's like a cash cow. I, I believe it's like whoever can oh, yeah. afford, whoever can afford oh, yeah. or buddy, buddy, good old boy system. Like this is my friend. So I'm going to do this for him or else it's like this person can afford to pay, um, basically bribes, cash bribes for uh, child custody. You know, in my situation, I, the guy that I'm dealing with literally told me he paid a hundred thousand dollars for my victim mentality that was never heard because it was dissolved by the same you know, people that he calls, he calls racketeers himself. So, you know, <laughs> the, right. the family courts have gotten bad. They've gotten really bad. And I don't think it's just in one state. I think it's really, it's all, so. Well, and then yeah. like the lack of oversight that there is. And then on top of that, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, your options are so limited and they yeah. intentionally just complicate the process so much to where you're like, your average everyday person isn't going to know where the heck to start or, or no. what to do to even be able to get any help that's effective. And then let's talk about judicial, absolute judicial immunity too. You know, it's like, oh, oh yeah. you can do something particularly egregious, it doesn't matter. Uh, the only way, you know, it, only if they act within all absence of jurisdiction, but then it's like, okay, there's all these ways to make sure that the things that they do are within jurisdiction. It's like, no. Uh, you know, no one in this country is above the law. That's that's what the Constitution says. And so, like, if we're all equal, we're all whatever. If you do something criminal to someone, you are uh, neglect you you not not just neglectful. If you're malicious in your duties and you're violating people's rights intentionally under color of the law, I don't give a crap if you are a judge or a sheriff. Why do judges get this extra layer of cushion? Um, you don't deserve it. If anyone should be held to the highest standard, uh, it should be the people who are making yes. decisions for our Absolutely. lives, our children. Yes. How so are they violating their oath and right. then given yeah. additional opportunities to violate the oath again? Yeah. And I make no exactly. mistake, the vast majority of them do again they just yeah. get smarter about how to do it yeah. i mean if you're penalized because you are in a power position and you take advantage and abuse that power position you should not only immediately lose your job you should never be allowed to hold another power oh. position ever again i mean you've proved what you're going to do with that i mean then that's all there is to it you know and they just let them go on, give them a little slap on the wrist. They have scapegoats, so they'll have yeah. women doing the same thing, the same job. Women judges, they'll use them as scapegoats. Yes. Make it look like it's not only the men judges. Yes, they do that in the uh, sheriff's uh, offices too. <laughs> yeah. I've yes. even seen people ask the judge to read them their oath right before they give a sentence or a, a judgment because you're kind of reminding the judge like, hey, what does your oath say? And yeah. it, it's true, it really is. I mean, no matter what the laws say, they are loosely defined and it's up to the judge's discretion. So that's where it's really scary because we know these judges used to be lawyers, they've seen it all. We know that they're all friends, we know they're all colleagues, yeah. we know that they have political campaigns and support each other. They're all at the same sports clubs, they're all at the same gyms, working out together, they go to the bars together. I've even had one of my lawyers say that. So we know for a fact that these are RICO violations, which is racketeering and criminal organization. Um, and the man who made the RICO law, he, specifically stated that he wanted 
that law to pertain to the you know mob bosses with the vowels for the last letter of their name and also they wanted them to pertain to the ivy league um you know white collar workers who you know we need to hold accountable because they have so much power in our society yes. so the problem is is no one's holding them accountable. So we're going to the attorney generals and we're complaining, we're giving them evidence. People are, you know, um, copying them on all of their emails and their and stuff. Uh, they're not doing anything with evidence, with complaints. They're, yeah. um, I mean, just the other day, Justice Jay was saying that every time she calls the FBI now, because she's filed with everybody, mm -hmm. Um her RICO violation uh, lawsuit, and they just hang up on her. Yes, I've had, I have the FBI's hung up on me also. I have a recording of it. Yes, oh my God. straight up. I told them, I have evidence. I have evidence to give you of corruption, crime, conspiracy, and under color of the law. I have evidence I need to give it to someone. Mm -hmm. They hung up on me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's up to the attorney general to investigate corruption in our government. Yeah. They can, um, they can like have somebody else do the investigation. Like sometimes they have Homeland security do it. So what do we know about all of this? We know that the corruption runs as deep as the FBI. Yeah. We know that, that it could be even deeper. Um, because we know about the paperclip project and we know that the paperclip project was where they went to Germany after World War II and the CIA, um, recruited the for scientists who were doing yes. the inhumane, um, testing on yeah. all of the concentration camp victims. And they gave them immunity to come to the United States and to, um, work with the universities out here. Well, Richard Gardner, who is the father of parental alienation, we know that he came out of Columbia, Ohio University. And this is like, there's a huge something going on in Ohio that is pretty disgusting. Uh, um, that's where I live. Trust me. Oh, <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. So, and I think that means that, you know, one or two of the scientists were placed in Columbia, Ohio, because part of MK Ultra was that they wanted to try to figure out the best way to keep the United States people in control so that we yes. could revolt again, so that we couldn't push back against a corrupt government again, like we did with, you know, the kings and queens and the revolution. So what I think is happening is MK Ultra was set up to do all of that research and to see how horribly disfigured people were after this kind of um, you know uh child sexual assault and then also just having people um outcasted in society through their involvement in family court or with CPS, because I mean, let's put it blatantly, social stigma is if you've lost your children, it's your fault. You are a bad parent. Mm -hmm. They don't really, the mass media the mass or the mass public doesn't really understand that this could happen to anyone. This, yes. isn't, this isn't, oh, they were bad or they were good. I mean, yeah, you might see some of that as well. But for the most part, a lot of people who are having their children taken from them are being taken from them in a way that is violating every single constitutional right uh, yes. that they have. And yes. that's why we go back to the RICO violations, because the RICO violations are what prove that. And we can even prove it, all the collusion. Um, we can prove the judges and the lawyers' interest in it all. We can prove how there is an interest in all of this and it's interesting because i saw an article the other day that said the doj should be investigating all of this but the doj is who wrote all of the laws from family court up until now that are actually set up in such a way to protect the abuser and to discredit the 
um, protective parent. It's interesting because my sister, who was also a victim of CSA, works for the courts now as the judge's clerk, and her mentality is so in line with that abuser protected mentality. And she even told me most of the women who come in here are lying. And I said, wow, do you really think that? And I said, wow, well, that's funny because studies that? show victims yeah. rarely lie. Less than 2%, <laughs> less than 2% of people will lie about sexual assault or mm -hmm. child assault. And she didn't believe me. And so that shows right there that the indoctrination that they have, whether it, it's from just, you know, they're talking to each other or whatever, um, because it could be as easy as her judge was like, oh, no, don't worry. They always lie. But they're definitely lying. It could have right. been. It's coming from somewhere if it's within the it office. Is. It is. So that's like this clique, this group, they're kind of passing these ideologies along, these, this indoctrination along. And, and we see it in um, CPS as well. Like I just watched this uh, CPS. Um, she was like the manager of CPS and she went in front of the Supreme Court and she was talking about, you know, all these things. And they were like, excuse me, are you saying that you're taking children from their parents without due process? Because did you know that in the United States, it's due process that if if the child is being physically harmed beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, so it can't just be oh, the CPS worker thinks the child's in harm. They yeah. have to try to prove that. They have to prove it just as much as we have to prove our evidence to the attorney general. And yet our evidence is all being overlooked. Nobody cares about it. And, right. and it's interesting because what flies in family courts with CPS is, oh yeah, I asked them to get a drug test and they didn't, and so they're dirty. Like that flies. And so they're really doing this without any due process at all, because it it states in federal law that you cannot take a child from a parent unless you believe that child is going to die. Yeah, imminent and you danger. Can prove it, and you can prove it. Yes, beyond a reasonable doubt, you have exactly. to have so, solid so, evidence that yes. shows such. And you know, they even have the government even has their own answers in their own statistics. I mean, yeah. if you go and look up the statistics for adoptions and placement, you know, children who are removed from their home, they'll give you, I mean, extremely detailed information with yeah. the cause and reason, the percentages, the exact numbers with people throughout the year that are in that situation. Over 40% of their own studies say that they are removed for yeah. neglect. Yeah, mm -hmm. neglect is yeah. not abuse. Yeah, and that's right. And it's interesting because the they agent leader. has the power to say whatever she wants. Exactly. To, um, that's what the neglect is. Uh huh. And this leader of the CBS division was standing in front of the Supreme Court arguing with them that what they were doing was okay because they thought that it was due process. But the Supreme Court was like, no, dude, you guys aren't even. You guys aren't even complying to federal law. One like, of the biggest problems is not right. And the CPS worker just argued with the Supreme Court and they had to shut her down. Yes. One of the biggest problems, though, is this. Our own judges, our people who are uh, operating the criminal justice system, these people don't know what due process is even. They don't know our constitutional rights and they could care less anyways. But my point is, and I can't remember, I saw it yesterday. I wish I could remember, but there was a judge that had to, um, there was a suit in Louisiana and they ended up, it was like a hundred thousand dollars, something like that. But anyways, uh, the lady, the judge that was in charge of the situation that violated this person's rights, she couldn't even tell them what protections were underneath that amendment <laughs> that, you know, okay. that she couldn't even explain the, you know, and that's like, these are the people that are making decisions yes. that affect yeah, our like lives. Their and job, and yes. they're basing it off of. This. Mm -hmm. They're basing it off of indoctrination and water cooler conversation that they're having with their coworkers. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
like the other day I was at the gal's office when everything was going down with my case. I overheard one gal talking to another gal saying that they wanted to remove a child from a mom because the child's teeth were bad. Do you know that that could be genetic? Yeah. And I was in shock that that is going to fly because they're supposed the gals are supposed to be the lawyers for the children oh but, but they're, if not, they're not trained oh no. properly if they're not trained to understand domestic violence if they're not trained properly at all then they make stupid uneducated decisions like that and That's did right. you know that all the gals are privately trained who's training them Right. You know, I wonder. Yeah, that. thank you. I wondered that because they just put through. I mean, I know in the state of Ohio, it was so bad that uh, they had to go out of their way to form a special advisory board because there were so many reports of guardian at litems not doing their jobs and just. I and mean, you know why? I mean, just straight up neglectful. And, and this was like recent, within like last five years or so, oh, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. and nothing changed. I mean, our guardian at Lightum is an absolute joke. And the things that she has done yeah. is absolutely criminal. And yeah. it's mm -hmm. like, and, but they get away with it. And these judges yeah. and, uh, and such protect them. You know I mean? They're attorneys as well. A lot of these guardian at Lightums are also attorneys. And yeah. it's like, y'all can't do that. Like you have people's lives in your hands. And if you think that you can, you know, take a child away from a loving, nurturing mother whose only concern is to keep her child safe and yeah. you're going to penalize her for that, you know, like, right. like, I just don't get it. So gals have to answer to no one so it's basically their private training they go they run with it right mm -hmm. um they aren't um excluded from the rico violations though you can still press rico violations and you can use them civilly in a civil court as well and if that civil court comes up to a certain amount of money that you could you know, a get back for compensation for what the damages that have happened, you can have it before a jury. So if it gets to a certain dollar amount, then it has to be a jury trial. So I highly recommend that what we do is we collect all these different gals, people can, um, you know, team up together to press these RICO lawsuit violations and just take down all these people one by one. Because if if X amount of people saw Sally sue the gal and Sally sue the gal violated their constitutional rights, then and they can prove it, then they can, um, you know, start that. And I think that's why um, Protective Mothers Revolution and Moms Fight Back are trying to find all the mothers who have been incarcerated from their family court cases because that's a great step to really prove that there were so many violations because why are protective parents being put in prison because they're trying to protect their children like that shouldn't even mm -hmm. happen at all that's a um, case anyways yeah. who in the hell do these family court judges think they are to you know pass down some kind of a judgment like that as if it's a criminal matter it is not exactly obviously so i love that you said criminal matter because what i see with family court is that it's a back door for abusers mm -hmm. and and so what has really got me and what i've really been thinking about with everything is that we all know that there's been pedophilia for like thousands of years right mm -hmm. so we know that there are certain sex or certain religious groups or cults or people groups that that practice that teach that to their children i mean i've heard the worst horror stories about mm -hmm. you know that kind of stuff coming out of the east coast like new york maine uh new hampshire pennsylvania like a lot of those places i've heard of kids who have talked about their parents sharing them these uh even human like I've heard it all and um so there's a woman who goes by uh her name is Corinne Hotspoot she's like German 
she wrote a book called Child Hunters, Requiem of a, of a Child Killer. And it's back, basically she was the person that would identify child killers for MI6, you know, out of London and also for the FBI in the United States. And they'd go to her and they'd be like, OK, this is the case. These are the victims. Who are we looking for? And she would profile them and be like, OK, you're looking for somebody who's in there. He's a teacher or they're the right. kids coach. They're like the soccer coach or, you know, and they were able to find so many children just based on her observations of like these people. She warns us. She warns us. She said that once seemingly innocent organizations are becoming full of corruption because these evil people, there's like two people in the world. There's people who wish to do children harm. Yeah. And there's people that are sane enough to know that that's really evil. She yeah. said, these people who wish to do children harm go out of their way to become judges, lawyers, doctors, you know, nurses, uh, teachers, school, you know, counselors, uh, band leader, you know, like that kind of stuff. Power position that involves yeah. children. They position themselves in a way that they can take advantage of children or support other people, enable other people to have access to abuse their children. So there's a really good article, it's called, Here Hides uh, Clinton's Pedophile Network. Oh, so if you can look up that, if you can look up that article, it, lists in detail all of the different movements that started with Bill Clinton's uh, office when he was pre president. Um, he signed the thing that made it so that CPS would get $4,000 for every child that they adopted mm -hmm. out. Him and some other people started the reunification camps, like just all kinds of stuff like that. And it's outlined in this article and it really shows the interest that they pedophiles have in our society because they've literally been using courts family court as a back door because honestly who in their right mind in a criminal case would be like okay this man just raped a girl let's give him the baby yeah you know? yeah no. Yeah. And look, and I'll tell you, it's like blatant too, because the situation that I was talking about, you can look her up. Her name's Krista Abelsoff. The judge's name is Judge Cash. Okay. This is a family court operation that's happening. But the thing about it is it should never have made it into a family court. The guy should have been charged, et cetera. But my exactly. point getting at it is, is like, this was on national, not just national, international news. Mm -hmm. And he's still blatantly denied her due process, denied her equal protection, um, denied her daughter due process and equal protection blatantly, like unapologetically. Yeah. Um, there yeah. is no, there's no accountability. That's the issue. Uh, absolute judicial immunity is an absolute joke that needs to be handled because that's one of the reasons why we're having this kind of problems over and over and over again. Yeah. And it's interesting because we call it the back door because it's exactly that. So, if somebody went into your house and harmed your children and then you went to criminal court, they would they would just process it. They would be like, OK, this is the yeah. information. This is the evidence. OK, they either have to go to jail or whatever, yeah. probation, whatever. And even those guys still get off easily. So we all know who's in charge, right? Yeah, like absolutely. I said a little bit ago, but it's all a big but, web. It just, yes, it just yes. goes everywhere. But if we did take anything criminal out of family court, we could make it harder for that to happen. So yeah. what I propose is that we start trying to push um, for anything criminal, anything violent, anything involving domestic violence or abuse that be held in criminal court first. Yes. And that anything that should be happening in family court happen after that. Because mm -hmm. in my instance, I mean, 
just like you all said, I wanted to get a protective order. I went to the courthouse to get a protective order. And before I could be seen inside the court for the protective order, my ex's lawyer came up to me and served me papers for the divorce. So that when we walked into the court, the judge said, oh, this is a divorce proceeding, not a protective order proceeding. And he rolled the protective order into the divorce proceeding, which made it go through the back door. Even though I had video evidence, yes. they decided to give him half custody on uh, supervised visits, even though the you know, district attorney hadn't even reviewed the evidence, hadn't even got back to me. They mocked me like it's a joke. It's yes, it is. I was threatened to never bring up abuse again or I'd lose full custody right then and there. So I was forced to go back to my abuser because yeah, of the, serious. Yeah, because of the criminal proceedings and how they just kind of sweep it under the rug in family court and allow all the abusers to go out the back door. Even though we had substantiated uh um reports with CPS. So they actually agreed with us that abuse abuse was happening and that the father was a covert um, opportunist, they called it. Like they just found him very high risk and very dangerous. He still walked away scot-free. He never, never got what, not, nothing. He got nothing. And I was about to get a protective order on him. And because he's a nurse, who has access to children in emergency medicine. He asked for, I asked him if he wanted to make a plea deal and give up his parental rights. And he said, yeah, because he knew if he didn't, he'd lose his career. So he still is out there. And then after he gave up his parental rights, I tried to push the protective order through again, but everybody in the courts bullied me. They were screaming at me. You can't do that. You promised. Mm -hmm. And I buckled. I gave in because I was all alone. I should have been like, no, fuck you. I'm still doing it. Yeah. Girl, I let me have, tell you. I didn't. And, and it's because of that, all of them yelling at me and bullying me. And that's family court. That's family court in the T is they're just bullying everybody to allow abusers to abuse children and to yeah. punish victims. Yeah, absolutely. I whenever I went in to file mine, I did file mine before he he did not have any matter of custody in the court. First of all, like I said, he didn't even have a right to move a petition for custody. But um, I filed on the 13th. For some reason, they documented it yeah. as the 14th. Well, what they did, and my minutes from the first court date come were facts from a criminal division of the court. What they did, and I can show it on paper, um, I can show it through the minutes, show it through the notifications. What they did was the judge that lawfully was allotted my case um, signed the order. Another, it was a hearing officer, his name's Jay Futrell. He came in and he altered the document that was signed by another judge, which is against the law. And he reallocated that document to Judge Cash, okay, in a family court division from a criminal division to a family court division. You can literally see it on their own paperwork, on certified documents. They reallocated my my uh, domestic violence. And I had like, I had self-admission of aggravated assault with a firearm on the audio recording. I mean, that's how, like, it was bad. And um, and tons of other evidence, like uh, solid evidence. Um, and first hearing was supposed to be on the 31st of July, 2020. The district attorney refused charges the day or two maybe before. It's noted in a financial document. I found it noted in a financial document, but never had seen it prior to that. And that was in 2022. And I found it, I started trying to dig and figure out what the hell happened to my case. Yeah. Okay. So it was a big collusion of people, but what they did was they reallocated the, uh, the case to from criminal to family, family court, which the guy didn't even have any family ties to me or my child. And then the district attorney who had already taken charges, refused the charges and, and had them removed. And then my, uh, abuse case, it never got heard which it wasn't actually abuse case. It was felony crimes of violence. It was aggravated assault with a firearm and strangling abuse killing, those kind of things. That just went away and it turned into a custody case. So yeah, it was like a, but but even though it wasn't in through the back door, it was like a back door maneuver. It didn't come in this way, but we can still do whatever the hell we want. We're gonna do whatever we want. You cannot do that. And 
the sad part for these people is it's black and white. It's on their own documents. You can see yeah. it, you can follow it. And it's like, you can only do that so long before you're going to get a pain in the ass like me. That's going to be like, oh, hell no. Like, you're not going to smile out of my face. Like, how have these many families just been absolutely destroyed mm -hmm. by this crap? You know, and it's yeah. not like, it's not like, you know, well, we're just acting within the law. They're not even doing that. Like, mm -mm. they are. People are afraid. Like, people are afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, I know people right now in Louisiana that are so terrified. Mm -hmm. the, okay. So, one of the people yeah. that I was discussing earlier, as soon as she went to the media, they slapped him. So, this is my same judge, okay, that's doing all this crap to all these people. But, they slapped embezzlement charges on her. They were completely false allegations. They arrested her for them. And so then she had someone come forward and threatened to go back to the media about it. Then they dropped the charges and they put them on her again. There's another case. This is insanity, which this was also my judge in national media. So there was a, a eight year old little girl. Um, and I can't ever pronounce their, their last name. And I'm going to send this to them after you put it out. So I hate to try and say it the wrong way, but Brett and Jamie, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so their, their little girl, I, I, I want to say she's like eight years old. Well, it's actually, she's the stepmother. And I say their child because she raises the child. She loves the child like her own. But the mother, the birth mother of this child, who the husband of her and the brother of the husband were molesting, assaulting, <clears throat> assaulting this child. Okay. Um, and kids confirmed it everything like this well one of the guys was actually a, already a, a offender against children okay and so they're going into the court with all this knowledge and they're like okay look so the guy hadn't been charged for her their child yet but he was with full knowledge that the dude was a one and two right. the child saying that they're her and three that a kid confirmed that the child had been a son, okay and he's still sending this child back into that home to be a. And so this goes on and on and on. Well, finally, somehow, and I don't know how they got around because usually in Tangipahoa Parish, in Louisiana, the state and the parish level people all stick together. If you are on the I'm not helping her list, you're on the I'm not helping her list. But somehow they ended up getting a criminal hearing for that. And the, both men were ch charged for and the girl but the mother wasn't who by the way the child stated that the mother held her down while the men to her and they're back in court and she's trying to get her rights back to her child and judge cash is just you know gonna do what he does probably but the thing is is this these people are destroying children they're destroying yeah. families they're destroying people's lives and it's like you know, people, I told my mom, it's like, you get so angry because like, for instance, my family members for a long time, I felt like, well, they just don't care. It's not that they don't care. They don't know. Yeah. Most people, like you were saying earlier, um, you touched on some of this a little bit, but you know, society is set up to, we're taught from a very young age that our government is good. The system mm -hmm. is good. If you yeah. are in trouble, it's because oh. you are bad. You did bad. And so you believe this system that's set up uh, a certain way and you believe that it protects people. You believe that there's justice. You believe all these things. Well, so until you're in a position yourself to have all those illusions busted, uh, you don't realize what it really is out there. You just think, OK, well, this person must have done something really bad or they wouldn't have lost a child. OK, this person must have done something really bad or they wouldn't have went to jail. Um, but the truth is that it's not not like that you know but people don't yeah. know that until it's them in the spot you know to know it Vanessa do you know Justice J I know of Justice J I don't know her personally my mom does okay. interact with her quite a good bit okay so she tried to do all the RICO violations I think what you need to do is because you know so many people that have been affected by your judge you need to get everyone together get all your evidence together and go hire a lawyer. And that's what people need to do. And that's why I have my website because I'm like, if, if, if we can find all the people that have been hurt by our judges and work with them to create a RICO violations lawsuit and because of the manner of it, because of the federal 
uh, crime of right. Of, it, it does. There's no statute of limitation. So, so you could go back for their entire career, and right. then and then I highly recommend that we do this all at the same time because right. once we get everybody grouped together against you know their abusers or offenders in the courts, then we get all the cases put together. We have all the lawyers ready, and then I say we all submit them all at the same time and just overwhelm the court overwhelm them. Because then it will draw media attention. It will draw, you know, public awareness. One of the problems is going to be this, this, though, and I don't know if you've ran into this where you are. Um, one of the problems is going to be, well, one, you have people like, for instance, one of the girls that's involved with that I was just speaking about. She is absolutely terrified. She just wants to be left alone. She just... She doesn't want to stir stir anything. She doesn't want to um, have her life destroyed by these people anymore. So the, you're going to have one you're gonna have issues where people are afraid to come forward. Two, the second issue is going to be this. And these are things that we just have to overcome. But the second issue that there's going to be, if it's anything like Louisiana in our general area, is that you're not going to have lawyers that will take it. So pretty much all the lawyers are sold out to the state. And so um, they run these criminal rings of lawyers in the, through the family courtroom, through the criminal justice system anyways. Um, and that's one way that mine uh, got away with what he did. He paid for it. Right. But, but so one thing. And you don't, don't need a lawyer. I was just saying it would be easier than teaching yourself the law. But you don't do need it. a yes. lawyer. You don't well, but you know to. what? You're right. And I'm writing. Actually, I've been filing and working on in 1983 um, for a while I, because I want it to be. But you know what? The thing about it is, is this. There has to be people who are if you can't get an attorney that cannot limit us from doing it. We just have to do it. And the thing is, too, there's going to be people um, like I was telling Danielle, each one of us brings something different to the table. So when we network, like I have a very good understanding of my constitutional rights um, and I have also I've studied in depth um, how they like, for instance, you know, and under substantive due process, it's very, you know, there's all these these stipulations that are put on whether or not, you know, you have to understand all those clauses, all the things that are. Un and when you bring that before the court, you have to understand that in com in relation to immunities for these people. And, you know, people need to just network because there's people who yeah. have doing different things. And so, like, I, you know, I told Jamie and uh, our, our offered to her and her husband that if they ever needed help trying to write their uh, complaint out, I would not mind sitting down with them and doing that. I may need help from someone else on something else that I'm not as great with. I do have a very strong understanding of my constitutional rights. We all have something different, but I guess what I'm getting at is do not let um, do not let the system bully you. If, if an attorney is not going to take your hands down case because they're sold out to the state or to or whatever, who cares? Like, do it yourself. Fight it. Um, the only way this shit stops is if we keep fighting. And the only way you can do that is in a courtroom because we can we what we're doing right now is great. Getting together, talking about things, exchanging ideas um, and networking. That's perfect. But the change part of it happens in a courtroom because the only way to change things is to hold these people responsible. They are used to doing whatever they want with no responsibility, no accountability, um, because lawyers won't take it, because this, because that. But step into your own space and defend your space. Um, don't don't let these people bully you out of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Just don't do it. And don't do it alone, because they, we need to do it all at once in yes. order to make such an impact that yeah. the public knows about it and that they get outraged. Yeah, it makes like, a statement. Wait yes. a minute, what? This is happening yeah. all over the world? There's people suing yes. the government all over the world because of this? And it's not just a hundred people, it's a millions of people? Well, oh, that's right. my this, number one goal with humanity. Is big violence is, you know, I mean, you've got you know, all these individuals and organizations and, and such. They're and corrupt too, by the way, all of I'm them. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I mean, like there's no one place for, you know, survivors to come together and to all interact together. And yeah, that's the only way we're okay. going to create change. We have to come together and it has yeah. to be big numbers that yeah. we're all doing at the same time. Yes, exactly. we have to organize 
as efficiently, if not more efficiently than they do. Because like I said, there's these people who wish to do children harm and these people yes. who know that that's evil. But then yet us who are being marginalized are still only a percentage of the good people. And the rest of those people have cognitive dissonance. And so they're just kind of like the people who are watching being ground up and sent to the cons. Yes. <laughs> but still like, wait, this isn't really happening or maybe they deserved it or, you know, they I mean? did something bad. They that, did because something that's what we're bad. Taught. That's exactly. what we're taught. That's what which, we're taught. Which makes sense how this is so successful, because if you think about it, this is exactly how people get picked out, um, you know, naturally if they are being preyed upon in in uh, the wild. So yeah. like if you're a gazelle and, you know, all of a sudden you get taken out, then it doesn't affect the whole group as if, you know, it was the entire group being hunted down. Because right, if it was right. the entire group being hunted down, they'd all fight for it. But yeah. if it's just one, then it's like, oh, that happened so quickly. I didn't even notice. Oh, well, life goes on. Well, and then they, everything is so they isolate you purposely with words and yeah. terminology like, you know, a conspiracy. This person's a conspiracy theorist. This person yeah. is crazy. And then that's linked to crazy. OK. And then you've got yeah. all these things. And so then anytime yeah. someone comes forward and says the truth that is happening to them, OK, then yeah. it's almost just that easy to just to have that person completely dismissed by society by just yes, saying they're okay. conspiracy theory. I do. And then you have judges issuing gag orders you yeah. know, that, that don't allow. Jamie and Brett have one right they, now. Yeah. They silence you. What's that called, Gage, when they try to discredit the the conspiracy people to make it seem like all conspiracies are incorrect? Uh, uh, these are psyops. They yeah. purposely do this to make the conspiracy theorists look crazy. That's why they yeah. started this whole flat earth thing so that anyone who feels like, hey, I've been lied to. Maybe I do live on a flat earth. Right, right, they've right. they've been so lied to their whole life and they see the corruption. And so they just start falling into line with all these psyop lies. And so then anyone who believes that maybe there's a pedophile ring that's controlling our government in of becoming a flat earther yeah yeah they and you group everything so and then everybody's crazy because if you think any of these things any of these categories of things that fall under conspiracy if you believe one of them then you're nuts uh and, well, then and look at how many throughout history have proven to actually be true oh, they all yes. Almost, yes. <laughs> yes. i mean any ones that are related to government i mean the cia literally can invented the word conspiracy okay yeah. uh the, yeah so it's just like and it was part of at the same time, wasn't it around the same time with all the MK Ultra and all that. Yeah, uh, yeah wow. that they did. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, but that it's all, all came intentional. Out at the same time, the MK Ultra, the. Um, it was when Kennedy was, right? Yeah. The anybody that believed that the. Ring, the uh, with Richard Gardner being the child expert, even though he was being paid by Columbia University to molest children. And he wrote 250 books about it. And this is about the same time reunification camp group started. Oh, yeah. It's about that the same crazy. time that um, Jeff and Madam or whatever were all being introduced to everybody so that they could perpetuate this need for pedophilia. And if you look at industry it's a it's a paper pipeline so i my ex-husband and i we met when he was 20 and i was 25 we dated for a long time and he was always addicted to um but when we first met his was just like normal i saw it every once in a while on the computer search or whatever you know and then it started getting weird i remember he was like watching told me oh you should i've seen even worse i've seen i've seen blah 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 so i knew he was dipping into the bad stuff yeah. and then next thing i knew he was so that yeah. combined with his trauma from um from his work uh being a paramedic on an ambulance in you know las vegas and then he was abused as a child his family is probably all um and he really wanted me to move back to Vegas because I think that 
Vegas also has a huge network there. If you haven't heard of the Kellehers, uh, everybody's trying to get rid of them. Um, but they are in power out there and they're doing everything that all these corrupt judges are doing. But, but like they're networking somehow because one of the gals that I was helping here in Utah, she was seven years old. She told me that her, um, you know, not in those words. She wasn't saying I'm being, she was like, men stand in the corner of my rooms at night. They give me gummies. They have, take pictures of me. They take videos of me. They do this to me. They do that to me. So basically she told us she was being, but without saying it. And so I was really concerned. I tried to tell her mom, you know, you've got to get away from the house in case he comes and tries to take her before you guys get a parental agreement. I was hoping that she would, you know, she told her counselors, but she refused the kits, uh, you know, the forensic examination. She refused that. So the, the mom let her refuse it. Um, and they ended up kidding her on Christmas Eve and giving her back to the father on Christmas morning. Um, and that's a big thing, too, if you don't know about that. So a lot of CPS kids get adopted out or taken from their families around Christmas because want kids for Christmas. Um, it's a huge satanic thing um, that has been going on for a long time. I mean, if you think about the legends of Krampus in Germany, it's been going on for a while. And um, you can uh, look into some stuff and uh, yeah. find uh, supporting evidence. There's got to yes. be I mean, all the statistics and such that there the are. The statistics is the it. evidence. The statistics is the evidence. And that's another reason why we need to come together collectively. Because if we have names, date of births, and then all the evidence and all of this compiled in a huge database, then it would be good. And I think Faces of Crisis, have you guys heard of that, is a really good mm -hmm. start to that. Um, it was made by the Women's Coalition. It's called Faces of the Crisis, I believe. And basically, um, it is a collage of women or people who have been oh, yeah, trying to protect their children. Mm -hmm. And there's hundreds of them, hundreds of thousands of them. And then um, and those are only people who were allowed to talk about their case. Like, I remember I wanted to join it and she said, is your case done? And I was like, no. And she's like, you can't join yet then. And I still haven't joined yet. So it's not all of them. It's just like a little chunk. I think that basically they know what they're doing. This is systematic oppression at its finest because, I mean, what better way to keep us all debt slaves but to keep us traumatized broken and disabled you know from this and they know for a fact that because that's what a lot of the mk ultra um tests or like you know uh experiments were about was that they know that trauma causes severe uh mental personality disorders so like dids dids um is the least severe a, a thing that can happen after a child's trauma and and stuff like this alienation from your you know attachment figure um they know that the next one is multiple personalities i mean if you think about civil have you ever read the book of civil i had to read it in psychology when i was in college and she was raised by her mother who was abusing her and other children in the neighborhood violently like she like used objects violently hurt them um and she grew up and she had these lapses in her memory and one day she woke up and it was like three years later and she was like what the hell where have i been i've got this key in my pocket and then she started seeing a psychiatrist the psychiatrist found out that she had like 26 different personalities that she had to split her brain up into 26 different personalities just to survive all the trauma that she went through as a child. And they know that if there's at least one attachment parent, one attachment figure in the child's life, that that can save them from developing a lot of these personalities, especially dids which is, uh, it's kind of like a identity disorder. So basically you're either hyper or hypos. 
And we know that, you know, hypersexuality is one of the number one um, effects of child trauma or abuse. And so um, Sybil uh, is a great example of like, you know, how horrible childhood trauma is for kids. And then there's also the ACEs study and the ACEs study came out of San Francisco. And that is basically a group of doctors who put together a questionnaire for all of their patients. They asked them how many traumatic events they had in their life uh, growing up and they would add those up. And the higher your score was, the more prone you were to have disease or some kind of mental illness or die early. And so they've proven that. So if if they also own all of the pharmacies, the, the hospitals, the doctors, then of course, why wouldn't they want a sick, broken, dependent on the government, dependent on counselors, dependent on the hospital, going and getting more meds? Um, and that's basically yeah. how they are enslaving us. They're the money scheme us. continues. <laughs> yeah, they're enslaving us through this brokenness because if we, if our children are so broken that they can't become the next Bill Gates, they can't become the next Elon Musk. Well, then Elon Musk and Bill Gates will always be Elon Musk and Bill yeah, Gates and, that's right. until they have their children be the next Elon Musk or the next Bill Gates.